Good morning. Um, welcome back. If you've come back, if you were here yesterday, you'll know that you're in for a terrific morning this morning. And you've come back because yesterday was a terrific morning. Ros was so helpful and stimulating and clear, wasn't she? And thought provoking and uh, so sure footed on the Q&A. And we learned so much about uh, what it means to be created in God's image. And um, that same clarity that same plain speaking, uh, that same accessibility is in Ros's book. So I just want to give you a a quick plug of the book, Uh, Human. It's available in the 10 of those bookstall around in base camp. Uh, If you've heard Jonathan Carswell review it already, you'll know that it's also part of the the bundle of books. So he's, I'm not going to review all four, but there are four books, aren't there, in a bundle that you can get for 20 pounds. Um, but if you want to just buy the book on its own, it's nine pounds. But it's a, a really good read. And yesterday, there were so many good thoughts that Roz shared. And she's not going to be able to share all of the thoughts that are in this book. So if you've enjoyed what she said this week so far, please keep coming to the seminars. But please also buy the book. Um, is that okay, Roz? That, I mean, please buy that? the book. I'm very happy for you to do that, yes. You have my permission. Excellent. If you'd like me to sign it, you will have to chase me down. (laughs) Okay, um, let me pray as we begin. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new day, with its new possibilities of hearing from you and from your word. Thank you for Roz and the way she's brought your word alive for us yesterday. We pray that you would be with her today as she does the same. We think of Jesus' words to come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. As we think about our brokenness today, we pray that our response will be to come to Jesus and to know his rest. Lord, you know all of our hearts. You know exactly where we are in life, where we are before you. Meet our need, would you, Lord, in Jesus. Meet our need through your word. Speak to us through Roz and give us hearts to respond. Will your Holy Spirit show us how to respond to you this morning and to live for you, to live lives that glorify the name of Jesus, for that's what we desire, for we ask in his name. Amen. Amen. Uh, good. Uh, David, just before you go, we, I did ask yesterday, there was, it was optional, uh, there was some homework. Did, did you manage to do the homework? I did. Will you, would you like to show us the person that you made? Are you sure? I mean, are we sure would we like to see it? Yeah, go on then. Well, I did do something, Roz. Good, I, I'm excited to see. Oh, so here it is. Carefully wrapped. Here it is, carefully Very precious. Wrapped. Excellent, excellent little toast person. Um, Toast man. Toast man, there you go. If you did do your homework and you've got it with you, uh, do get it out because you'll need it uh, in a little bit. Um, Good, thanks, David. Right, Uh, I don't know if if you're still coming in. There's loads of room at the front. You are going to need to be sitting near somebody because you're going to have to talk to them. I'm sorry, I know, but you are. It's a seminar. Deal with it. Um, If you've had a chance to uh, have a look at the question that's been on the screen as you've been coming in, 
What is the worst news story that you've seen in recent months? I don't know whether anyone uh, uh, has one that they'd like to share, something that you remember seeing, maybe something that really stuck you right in the front row. Oh, OK, there first, yeah. The uh, BBC did a sort of montage of all the floods around the world. Right. Just brought home how horrific it was. Yeah, great, thank you. Just those stories of uh, destruction all around the world in flooding, yeah. February 24th last year, invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The invasion of Ukraine, um, still ongoing, still desperate. Yes. A lady in an Arab country who was put to death for not, I think, for not wearing a hijab or something. Yeah, yeah women put to death in an Arab country uh, for being incorrectly dressed. Absolutely. Uh, somebody here, have you got someone at the back there? Yes, go on. Uh, Yemen, it's a forgotten war, it's a proxy war between the Saudis and the Ra Iranians. Yeah, more war, conflict, absolutely. Uh, anything different? Anything got one to add? I mean, there are loads, aren't there? We could go on just one there. Yeah, one last one. Christian leaders being... Oh, the scandal of Christian leadership. I mean, it's just heartbreaking, isn't it? And maybe for some of you, there's been personal... Uh, involvement with that at great cost. It's hard, isn't it? I had to stop watching the news in 2020 after the COVID outbreak. I, I just couldn't cope with the onslaught of bad news all the time, every day. Death, destruction, conflict. It's sin, isn't it? Sin is everywhere. Everywhere around us, we see sin in that desperate situation still going on in Ukraine every day, in the bombs and the guns, the destructions of the homes and the hospitals, the land grab and the power grab, the greed, the arrogance, the anger, the hatred. See, sin that seems to be the norm in modern politics, doesn't it? Lying and deceit, personal gain, bullying, Sin has broken the universe that God created. The very ground itself is cursed to be unfruitful with thistles and weeds, with flooding destroying so much of it at the moment. The ground is broken and we are broken. Our humanity is broken. We are broken because by nature we are opposed to God. This is what Hannah says uh, in 1 Samuel 2. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven and the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. That is the very nature of sin, isn't it? To oppose God. To set ourselves in opposition to God. And the result of that is that we will be broken. But of course, our broken humanity is still humanity. We haven't lost our humanity entirely. It, all the things we talked about yesterday morning, if you were here for that seminar, are still true. We are still, in some respects, like God in his image. It's still true, of course, that we are not God. It's still true that we were created to demonstrate his glory, to work and to rest, to be fruitful, to rule and subdue, to be like Christ, the true and perfect human being. It's just that it's a lot harder now. So what we're gonna do this morning is spend most of our time looking at the ways in which we are broken, in which our humanity is broken, how to live as broken human beings, in a broken world, before briefly coming on at the end to think about how we are being mended and will be mended. So if you did your homework, get it out now. Here's mine. I thought I'd do an entirely generic human being. Uh, nothing like any person. What is it they say? Not based on anyone in reality, living or dead. Um, so the first thing is that we are broken physically. If you've got yours, you can rip yours up as well. 
I did say, don't get your children emotionally invested in your creation. So in Genesis 3.16, God says to Eve, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. That is to say, her bodily functions involved in giving birth are affected by the curse put on humanity as a consequence of sin. She will suffer pain because of her sin. So the fact that it is hard to give birth, that it is painful to go through menstruation, that it is physically demanding and destructive to go through pregnancy, that there can be physical consequences after birth, that it is deeply painful to suffer with infertility or miscarriage. All of this is brokenness that is not part of our true humanity, part of our broken humanity. Every woman, past the age of puberty at least, carries this reminder of sin's consequences in their bodies, one way or another. Female human bodies were certainly designed to bear children, but the physical suffering that we associate with that is not actually necessary or inevitable. Maybe you've met one of those women who just seems to bloom during pregnancy and whose labor was swift and straightforward and you just think, how, how, how does that happen? Well, you look at other species. Not every species of animal, for a start, is designed to bear children at all. You know, you just lay an egg and you're done with it. But, you know, mammals of other species don't go through the same sort of agonies that human women often do. This isn't how it needed to be in creation. This is how it is in broken creation. And so God continues in Genesis 3:17 towards Adam. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you'll eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. So the curse addressed to Eve is carried within her body. She is broken. Adam's curse is to live in a broken world. The good and fruitful work that he was given to do in Eden will now become painful, hard labor. It will be hard to produce enough food to eat. It will be hard to sustain life. There will be obstacles in the way of his productive work. This isn't how it was made to be. This is how it was broken to become. And those initial curses addressed to Adam and Eve are representative of the way in which sin impacts all of creation and all of humanity. When Jesus, many thousands of years later, is asked about the reason why a man was born blind, he's very clear. It's not because this man sinned, nor his parents. It's because we live in a broken world where there are things that don't work in our bodies. And for that particular man, so that the works of God might be displayed in him. He was blind so that God would be glorified. So, we know this, don't we? Disease and disability are not part of true humanity. They are part of our broken humanity. Physical reminders that we all of us live in a broken physical world where our bodies do not work perfectly. They are one reminder of the ultimate consequence of sin, which is to say, death. Despite the increasingly desperate efforts of some people to try and stave off the inevitable, our broken bodies will all eventually fail, whether it's through disease or decline, disaster or decay. Your body will eventually stop working. Death is not, of course, merely physical, but it is physical. It is something that takes place in and through our bodies because of sin. If you want to think more about our physical bodies, how they were made to be and how they are in our broken world, we are going to be thinking about that in a lot more detail 
on Thursday morning. Uh, no seminar tomorrow morning, it's the Keswick Lecture. Don't come expecting me, come expecting something much better. Uh, but Thursday morning, we'll be back here and thinking about being uh, bodies, uh, bodies and souls. So that's the first way in which we're broken. Here's the second way. We're broken emotionally. Let's go back to Genesis 3.16. What else does God say to Eve? He says, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. That word desire comes just three times in the Hebrew of the Old Testament. Here, Genesis chapter four, verse seven, and in the Song of Songs, chapter seven, verse 10. In the Song of Songs, the desire is clearly positive and even redemptive. In Genesis four, it is sin itself which desires. It is clearly negative. So the curse I think that we see in Genesis three is not so much that she will desire, because desire can be good or evil. It is what she will desire and why and how. Her desire will be for her husband and it will make her vulnerable to him and we'll come on to that in a moment. But just note for a moment that sin has an effect on your emotions. Sin has an effect on our feelings, our wishes, our desires. Three ways in which I think you can see your emotions are broken. Firstly, we direct our emotions towards the wrong things, don't we? It's not wrong to delight in beautiful things, but it is totally wrong to covet those things when they aren't yours. It's not wrong to experience sexual attraction, but it is totally wrong to lust after somebody you are not married to. It's not wrong to want the best for your children, but it is totally wrong to push them towards academic excellence at the expense of their faith in Christ. It's not wrong to be afraid of danger. It's totally wrong to be more scared of looking stupid than of facing God's judgment, and so on. It's not necessarily that the emotion is a wrong emotion, but it is directed in a way that does not honor God and puts yourself first. Second, I think we respond the wrong way to different kinds of situations. So when I'm late, I mean, okay, Philip, I know I'm always late. When I am late because I was disorganized leaving home, what do I do? Well, pretty often I put the blame on all the other drivers who stupidly stick to the speed limit instead of acknowledging that it was my mistake. When someone gets caught out telling a lie, What's their response? Are they gonna get angry about being found out or repentant because they lied? Quite often anger, isn't it? When that person at work who's always irritated you turns out to be just not very good at her job, you feel smug and self-righteous or concerned for them, wanting to help. When you eat that fruit that you were specifically told not to, do you hide in shame, cast the blame on anyone else but yourself? Emotional responses are broken by sin. The third way I think we can see that our emotions are broken is that we give them too much control. In fact, I think that one of the biggest lies we hear so often in society today is that we just have no control over our emotions. I can't help how I feel. The most important thing is just to be true to how you feel, to express how you feel, no matter what that is. If you have no control over your emotions, you can't be blamed for them. But that is not what God says. In fact, our emotions are under our control. They are under the control, very often, of our sinful nature. But if you are a Christian, they are also under the control of the spirit in you. Your emotions could be sinful or godly. If your emotion is sinful, don't add to that sin by expressing it or acting on it or giving it control. If your emotion is sinful, repent of it. 
You can't trust your emotions. Your emotions are as much affected by sin as every other part of you. So what could you do about your broken emotions? Well, firstly, recognize that they are part of your sinful nature and question them. Are you right to feel the way that you do? Are you right to be angry? Are you right to be upset? Are you right to feel smug and self-righteous? Almost certainly not. Is your response a godly desire? Is it a Christ-like response? Second, if you realize it isn't, repent. Repent to the Lord. If you need to, apologize to people who you've affected by your emotional response. And thirdly, plan to do better. Recognize your sinful response more quickly and consciously turn away from it. Notice the kind of situations where you do respond in an emotionally ungodly way. The more you do this, I promise, the easier it will become. Many years ago, I said many years ago, I don't know how many years ago, I noticed that I really struggled when I was stuck in a traffic jam. I would get frustrated, I would get angry. I mean, it wasn't anybody's fault, there wasn't anyone to blame, but I would just sit there seething in the driver's seat of my car. And I was like, this, this isn't good. It's not helping me. It's certainly not helping me get anywhere quicker. I need to do something about that. And so I deliberately said, right, when I notice I start to feel like this, I'm going to start singing a Christian song. It's in my car. No one has to listen. It's fine. And initially, it would take a little while. It would take a couple of minutes of being seething and angry. And then I said, oh, do you know what I was going to do? I was going to start, and I would start singing this song. And over time, that got much quicker. And I would start feeling like, I'd be like, right, sing the song. Until eventually, my brain just bypassed the angry bit, and I would be in the traffic jam, and I'd sit there calmly, and I'd be singing and praying and thinking. And the, the sinful anger and frustration and emotion had gone. Your emotional response can change. One of the most helpful pieces of wisdom on this comes not from me in the car, but Jesus uh, in the Sermon on the Mount who tells us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If somebody's persecuting you, your initial emotional response is unlikely to be love. I mean, it might be because you're very godly, but probably someone persecutes you, your initial response is anger and irritation and, you know, it's desperately not fair and all of this. What do you do? Jesus says, pray for them. If you are praying for someone, inevitably, your emotions towards them will change. You will start to genuinely love them. It is extraordinary. So true humanity is emotional, of course. Christ himself displays emotions. We see grief and anger and joy and love and all sorts of things. But our humanity is broken emotionally. And perhaps our, our emotional lives are where sin is most often evident. Thirdly, we are broken relationally. We are broken relationally. So back to Genesis 3.16, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. So at this point in creation, there is only one human relationship. There's Adam and there's Eve man and woman, husband and wife, that is all of society and all of humanity. And as a result of sin, all the relationships that exist, which is to say one, is broken. Where there has been mutual love, common purpose, openness without shame, there is now vulnerability, manipulation, there are power grabs, miscommunication, mistrust. It's not simply a problem in marriage. What's the very first relationship we see after Genesis 3? Cain and Abel, brothers whose relationship breaks down to the point of murder. True humanity is to be in community, in relationships. We're going to look at that on Friday morning. We need each other. We need to not be alone. And yet, because of our sin, our relationships are broken. Not all relationships are completely broken. Obviously, not every marriage ends in divorce. Not every friendship descends into bitching and fighting. And not every brother and sister grow up to kill each other. 
It is true that some relationships become so broken that it's hard to see how they could ever be salvaged. When trust has been destroyed, when there has been abuse, when there is simply no desire to patch things up, there may not be much that you can do. But even those relationships which don't get anywhere near that sort of level are always relationships between sinners. And we are sinners who are cursed to be bad at relationships. We are bad at trust, bad at considering each other's needs. We are eager to get what we can out of a relationship rather than think about what we can give. We are too tempted to control or to rule over somebody when we spot weakness, too reluctant to speak hard truths and risk rocking the boat. We are not good at being honest, helpful, generous, charitable, patient, kind. We are broken. The closer you become to someone, whether that is a friend or a partner or a family member, the more vulnerable we become. The more we let someone else see what we are really like, the more we have to trust that somehow they will still love us anyway. The more we share with them our hopes and our dreams, our fears and our desires, the more opportunities we give them to hurt us really, really badly. Some of us naturally respond to that by closing ourselves off, just not letting ourselves enjoy the blessing of close relationships so that we never have to fear the hurt that can come from someone close to us. Some people respond to the vulnerability of a close relationship by letting their inner bully loose. You can see immediately how you could manipulate someone, how you could use what they've trusted you with to take advantage. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. It is because Eve desires Adam so much that he is able to take advantage to manipulate, to rule over her. The curse is addressed to Eve, but clearly this is a curse which affects us all, men and women. And while it is true that men are more likely to be the abusive partner in a marriage, that is by no means always the case. Any one of us, given the right motivation and circumstances, I think could be tempted to use or abuse another person joining in the gossiping that turns into workplace bullying, taking advantage of the goodwill of a friend at church to offload all the tasks that you don't want to do. Back in the last millennium, I uh, was a teacher. It wasn't a great idea. I don't really like children. Uh, But I I was a teacher for a few few years, and I, I sometimes find myself telling my class to do things not because I needed them to do those things or even because I really wanted them to do those things, just because I knew they would. Yeah, it wasn't great. And at the point where uh, one of my students, uh, it was a secondary school, but even so, one of the students um, truanted because she was too scared to come to my class when she hadn't done her homework, I knew I needed to leave teaching. It was definitely making me into a person I did not want to become. It is sin. It is all sin, every part of us. That is what we mean, by the way, if you've heard people talk about the doctrine of total depravity. It doesn't mean that we are all as sinful as we could possibly be every moment of the day. It means that every part of who we are, our bodies, our minds, our hearts, our relationships, are all affected by sin. And of course, therefore, our relationship with God himself. We are broken spiritually. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And after he drove the man out, He placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Back in Genesis 3, 
22 to 24. The Garden of Eden is not only the place where Adam and Eve enjoyed physical health in a fruitful land, not only the place where they enjoyed true, healthy, emotional lives and unhindered relationship with each other, it was also the first and true sanctuary, a place where they could walk and talk with God, knowing him to be their creator and their Lord, honoring him in their obedience, no barriers between them. Because of their sin, they are banished from the garden and thereby banished from God's presence and the intimacy with him they once enjoyed. Our sin is both a sign that we are broken spiritually and the cause of our spiritual brokenness. Because we do not have our hearts rightly oriented to God, we disobey him in all that we do and say and think. We disobey him in our emotional lives and our relationships. And because we disobey him, our hearts turn further and further away from him. Because we set ourselves in the place of honor, we make ourselves into the gods of our own lives, seeking our own glory, status, wealth, comfort. And because we make ourselves into gods, we discard the true God whose place we have usurped. Our sinful nature is what makes us sin and our sins deepen and strengthen our sinful nature. We are broken spiritually. Since the fall, uh, when humanity was first cut off from God, none of us have of our own accord sought God. No wonder Paul tells the Ephesians that they were dead in their transgressions and sins. No way out for those who do not even want to leave. You cannot climb out of the grave while you are digging yourself deeper into it. So our broken humanity is broken in every possible way. I want you just now to take a couple of moments to reflect on that uh, and, and talk to each other about this question. Yesterday we talked a little bit about as humans being made to glorify God. How is it that broken humanity, our brokenness in our bodies, our minds, our hearts, our souls, how can we still fulfill that role of bringing glory to God? So take a couple of minutes and then we will have time uh, for some questions then before we move on to the last part. I know I've done a lot of talking, uh, so have a few minutes, think about questions, think about this question.
questions, Green, do take a moment to think about other things that I've said, questions you might want to ask uh, in a moment. Okay, how did you get on? Let's, let's do the question on the screen first and then we'll move into more general questions. How can the brokenness of humanity bring glory to God? Did anyone manage to, to think of any ways in which that, that could be the case? Yeah, right next to the microphone, perfect. We, we can allow our brokenness to be glorify God if we apologize for an action. Right. We go in humility, say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Yeah. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Every time we repent, every time we apologize, we recognize that we have done the wrong thing, that God's way was the right way, and that honors and glorifies him. Every time we recognize and admit openly the wrongness of what we have done and apologize for it. Great. Any, anything else? What, how else might we? Oh, yeah. Uh, I think we're um, constantly reminded of our need and dependence. And if we're dependent, then, then yeah. we need to rely on God. Totally. We looked at that yesterday in terms of just our limitations and that we need to rely and depend on and trust God. But the same is equally true of our brokenness our failings, our flawed humanity, in whatever aspect of our lives, it's a sign and a reminder, isn't it, that we can't get stuff right on our own, that we need God to depend on. There was someone at the front, I think a hand went up, I don't know, Alison. Uh, I, broke, I grew up in a family that was deeply broken, many broken relationships, divorces and everything. Um, and the fact that I've been married to my husband for 32 years now, yeah. um, I believe brings glory to God, the fact Absolutely. that it is possible. <laughs> Wonderful, yes, a, a family can often be the worst place, can't it, for seeing dysfunctional relationships. But to be able to come out of that situation and honor God by living a, a long-term, faithful, loving marriage relationship, that is a wonderful testimony to God's glory, isn't it? Yes. Hi, we were talking about the fact that um, sometimes if we go through chronic illnesses or real difficulty, if our trust remains in the Lord Jesus, even through death, yeah. that can bring him glory and point other people to Jesus. Absolutely right. I, I don't know if I'm thinking of the same person as you, but probably um, the, the absolute wonder of seeing gospel joy and hope in the face of somebody who is dying that brings glory to God, doesn't it? When they, you know, anyone else might look and think your life is ruined, you're dying young, you are unable to feed yourself or do anything, you would feel sorry. But when you look at that person's face and it is filled with joy that they are going home to be with the Lord, I mean, the glory that that gives to him is extraordinary. Yeah. 
Good. Um, um, do feel free to throw in if you've got more comments on that, but also if you've got other questions about what we've talked about, the different ways in which our humanity is broken, how to live out that humanity as broken people in a broken world. Do start to, to put your hands up and ask somebody again. At the, oh, let's go there. Yeah. So we, we've got two more ways of brokenness bringing glory to God. One is the fact that it allows God to show his mercy, yeah. which wouldn't be possible if we weren't broken. And the second is that God uses us, the fact that God uses us um, in our brokenness and we can still see him at work in us, that brings him lots of glory because we're, yeah. it's a, a treasure in a, a jar of clay. Absolutely, in our weakness he is made strong. We'll come on to talk about the, the, the mercy in, that's demonstrated uh, in a moment, but, but that second point, really important, is it's not just that God uses strong people and perfect people and, and whole people. No, he uses broken sinners. Isn't that amazing? How glorious is he that he can even use people like you and me, messed up, to achieve his purposes in the world? Wow. Yeah, uh, someone over here? That's a question. Um, so you talked about the physical, emotional, relational, spiritual brokenness. And I was just wondering, I was sort of expecting you to talk about the mental brokenness. Okay. And um, yeah, thank what were you. your thoughts on that? Yeah, I didn't really have a separate category for that. And I did think about whether I should. Um, I will talk about it a bit more on Thursday when I talk about body and soul and, and where our sort of minds and our mental state fit with that. I think the, the sort of really brief answer is, I don't think it's as easy to separate out our minds from our bodies as we sometimes say it is. So I would say actually quite a lot of what we call mental illness is really physical illness. It's just illness around our, our brain and our functioning in that sort of way. So I would categorize it in that same way. And also obviously it, it sort of bleeds into our emotional uh, life and, and our spiritual life as well. So I haven't separated it out, but it is, it is definitely, insofar it is a distinct thing, it is a way in which we are broken. Yeah, so thank you for just um, highlighting that, definitely. Uh, good, yes, oh, sorry, are you waiting for, oh, here, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I hold to the view that we're all equal in, in the sight of God, but mm. you, as, as you were describing uh, the pain of, of womanhood in terms of things, um, it, I felt a hurt in, yeah. in, 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 in that sense. And how do you, it, it felt like, women get the really raw end of the deal. <laughs> um, but we're in it together. So how, yeah. how, come, how can, I guess from speaking yeah. as a man, how, 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 can you, how can we not blame women yeah. more? And how can we not uh, feel that women suffer more? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it is true, isn't it? Uh, there's a, there is a very, very clear, and I want, I want to say this as clearly as I possibly can, strand in the Bible, men and women are equal. In Christ, there is neither male nor female. We are saved in exactly the same way to have exactly the same status before God as saved sinners. And yet when we look back at those chapters in, in Genesis, there is a, an asymmetry. What is said to Eve is not exactly the same as what is said to Adam. Although I think um, the, the sort of wider picture of that does work both ways. Men are broken physically as much as Eve and and women still have to work in a broken world as, as much as Adam did and so on. I think, and you know, maybe it is because I'm a woman and I notice these things more. There is something about the way in which women's bodies work that carries within us that very bodily, regular reminder of sin and its consequences. But that means we also carry within our bodies a very regular physical reminder of the glory of our salvation. So you may remember the, the story in the Gospels where Jesus meets that woman who's been bleeding for 12 years. And obviously that's a physical issue, but for her it's also a spiritual issue that cuts her off from the community. It's a relational issue that she's covered with that shame. Uh, probably there's all sorts of emotional and, and mental issues associated with it as well. And she sneaks up to Jesus and touches the edge of his cloak and, and is healed physically and it's not until 
he, uh, he stops and he says, you know, come on, come on, come on, show yourself. And, and makes her show herself so that she can also be healed relationally in front of everybody and from her shame and, and in all of those ways and restores her. And I think there, there is just a wonderful truth about that if you're a woman here, to know that your access to God is absolutely unhindered by any of your bodily functions unlike in the Old Testament. But here's the thing, we don't talk about it very much, but it is also there. In the Old Testament, men were also hindered from access to God because of their bodily functions. Not menstruation, wet dreams. That's why we don't talk about it as much in church, but it's also there and it's also true. And it is also true that men, you are healed from that too. You are restored physically and emotionally and mentally and spiritually. So I think those things do exist for both men and women in different ways. And maybe we don't always talk about them as clearly with respect to both. But I also think it is true that being a woman is not just hard because of the consequences of sin that come from God directly, but it is hard because we live in a society where one of the consequences of our sin is the outworking of Genesis 3.16, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And women have been ruled over, not just by their husbands, but by the whole of society in in various kinds of ways. I I just think that is true. I think it continues to be true in some ways. I think as men, the best thing you can do is be conscious of that. Talk to women, ask them why they seem really sensitive about something, because it's probably not that they're really sensitive, it's just that they've experienced hurt in many, many ways over the years, and they're sort of braced for it. Ask them, ask them how you can make life easy for them. Ask them if there are things that, I don't know, that you do at your church or that you do in your workplace that actually make them feel excluded, make them feel different. I don't know, talk to them. That, that's my top tip. Um, talk, talk to a woman if you haven't. And um, I mean, may, maybe, maybe do some little kind of light, you know, small talk before you get straight into asking them about their bodily functions. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think maybe... I made it sound more uneven than it is in the way I present it, but nonetheless, be aware that even if it's not completely uneven, it is different. Um, And your experience of living as a broken man will be different from my experience as living as a broken woman. But male and femaleness is part of our true humanity. We'll do more on that on Thursday as well. So yeah, lots lots to unpack. There. Yes, Jane. Hi. Um, with the relationship brokenness and vulnerabilities, what's your view on confessing sins to each other? So again, what's my view on confessing sin? Confessing to sin each to each other. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, we're told to do it, aren't we, in the New Testament? And I don't know how often you do that, um, but it is. A, it it can be a very good and important thing to do. I think what happens when you confess your sin to a person is you have to articulate that sin out loud to yourself and to the Lord. And then you have to confront it. And that's why I think it can be a very good thing to have to do. I don't think it means we all need to confess all our sins to each other all of the time. You know, that that woman I just told you to go and talk to, probably best not stop that conversation by confessing your sin of pornography use, for example. Um, So I I don't think it's a command that we need to do it in the way that in the Roman Catholic Church it is, that no sin can be absolved or forgiven until it's been confessed uh, to a priest. I don't think that's true. I think, you know, we repent uh, and we turn to the Lord and we repent even of those sins we haven't noticed and, and we trust that he forgives all of those. It's not about our salvation status but I think it can be about our spiritual status that is about recognizing 
not just a sin that we happen to have done, but a sin that is deeply embedded in us, that is uh, habitual in our lives, that is uh, causing effects on our relationships and our emotional lives and so on. And to be able to say to somebody you know and somebody you trust, I need to tell you what's going on. And let them help you. That's where I think it fits relationally, is you need them to help you. You need them to help you as you pray about it, as you think about it, as you try to overcome it in the Spirit's power, because that will be an ongoing struggle. And it's hard, and you're not supposed to do this alone. Come on Friday, and we'll talk about why we need each other in community. Um, I don't think we should be confessing sins in a way that is making our relationships take the place of God. I do think we should be confessing sins which, if the other person then found out in some way, could break the relationship. So, you know, the classic example of, I had an affair, my husband doesn't know, he, does he ever need to know? Yes. Yes, he does. Yes, he absolutely does. That's not really a, a confession. I mean, it is a confession, but it's, it's not for the purpose of you dealing with your sin necessarily. It is for the purpose of living out that relationship, trying to mend. The relationship is already broken. It can't be mended unless he, both, he knows it's broken as well. So, yeah, lots of complicated ways that that will apply. Um, but, yeah, somebody just in front had a hand up there. Okay. I think we probably only have one more question, so. Can I just clarify something with you? Because I was hearing from you that um, illness, issues, and things like that is all down to sin. Um, I'm not sure I would agree with you. <laughs> I would say that absolutely, as humans, we, we do sin. Um, the work I do across the country is in personality disorders. So I work with, um, have an MSc and work with relationships and emotions and many, many things and lots of research in different ways. And, and I wouldn't say it's all down to sin. Okay. May, maybe sometimes it's the sin of others that has led to that situation. Yeah, can I clarify? Because I think you're right. I, have, I think you have misheard what I was trying to say, okay. which I may have said it wrongly. I, I am not saying that these aspects of our brokenness are all as a result of our individual sin. It's not that I sinned and therefore I got cancer. It's certainly not that I sin and therefore I have this kind of personality disorder. That is not the sin. What I am saying is, because of sin as a whole, creation as a whole is broken, and humanity as a whole is broken, and some of the ways that we see that are held within our bodies and our minds, and so on. So in a world where there were no sin, if we all still lived in the Garden of Eden, nobody would be ill, nobody would be disabled, nobody would have whatever. When we think about our new creation, which we're going to come to talk about in a moment, those things will be mended and healed. Okay, thank you for the clarity. Yeah, so please don't hear that. If you are somebody or you love somebody uh, who is struggling with some kind of disease or disability or disaster or in any way, you know, when Jesus is confronted with that man born blind and the Pharisees say, who sinned, him or his parents? Jesus says, no, that's, that's not what this is about. It's not a punishment for a specific sin at that point. It's living in a broken world with broken bodies and minds. Okay, on which point we're going to go on to our last section as we think about being mended, being redeemed, being restored. So here's our broken humanity. Uh, I, I am not going to now suddenly do a magic trick and put all of this back together. That is where we're at. But the glorious news of the gospel is that God has mended and is mending our brokenness. 
So I don't know if you've heard of the Japanese craft of kintsugi. Uh, if you're on the internet, you probably have, because it seems to be everywhere. It is a way of mending broken ceramics with gold. The cracks are not hidden. Like, you know, if you've ever tried to mend something, you put a bit of super glue on and you stick it together, and then by the time it's dry, you can see the line. And the line sort of goes yellow, and it's really obvious, and it's pretty ugly. In Kintsugi, you mend it with gold, and it becomes glorious. The mended pottery is not simply restored to its unbroken state. It is made even more beautiful and valuable than before. That is what God is doing with us. The Lord Jesus took our brokenness into himself so that we can be mended. Not only restored to a sinless state, but made even more glorious in our redeemed existence. That is one way, perhaps the most important way, in which our broken humanity brings glory to God. We demonstrate in ourselves the glorious work that he has done of redemption and recreation. So we know Jesus lived a physical life in a broken world. He got hungry, he got tired, he suffered pain, ultimately the most agonizing pain on the cross. He bore physical brokenness in his body in order to redeem our physical bodies from their brokenness. We saw that demonstrated through his physical miracles of healing and resurrection, a little tiny foretaste of the healing and resurrection we all enjoy in the new creation. Jesus lived an emotional life. We talked about this before, joy and delight, love, friendship, grief, anger. More than that, he bore our sorrows and our griefs. On the night before his death, he went to a place called Gethsemane and Jesus says to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him and began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Jesus bore our emotional distress, our emotional sins, our shame, our selfishness, in order to redeem our broken spiritual lives from their brokenness. Jesus' life was embedded in a matrix of human relationships with his birth family, with his disciples, and with many more. From the point of his arrest onwards, he is deserted by all those who proclaim the deepest loyalty to him. The disciples flee. Peter disowns him. Even the women stay at a distance. Jesus bore the pain of relational breakdown in order to redeem our relationships. In the New Testament, this is most pointedly demonstrated by the reconciliation between Jews and Greeks. Christ makes one new humanity out of the two. If even that deeply embedded enmity could be reconciled in Christ, there is hope for all of our broken relationships in this life and eternity. And most extraordinarily of all, of course, Jesus even experienced broken spirituality for us. On the cross, he experiences that separation from God, which is the consequence of our sin. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Christ's spiritual brokenness in that moment is for us to redeem us from our banishment, to open the way for our reconciliation with God. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he signals this redemption. He offers forgiveness to sinners. He welcomes in the spiritual outcasts. He gives his disciples true access to the living God. Our spiritual redemption in Christ is real, even while we are still putting to death our sinful nature. And we will enjoy that spiritual redemption in all its fullness when our bodies, our hearts, our minds, and our souls will be restored completely and perfectly. I always forget to do this. Our scars, like Christ's, will be visible, but made glorious. 
those streaks of gold where our brokenness has been mended will shine with the glory of our redemption. So tonight's homework, if, if you choose to do it, is to mend your broken person. And if you can, make it even more beautiful. We'll see. I'll, I'll show you mine on Thursday. I don't know what it's gonna look like yet. Um, so we're gonna do, like I say, break from this seminar tomorrow, bodies and souls on Thursday. We'll think more about our bodiliness as human beings, our broken bodies. We will be asking some of those questions that are around at the moment. What is a woman? Why does no one seem able to answer that really simple question anymore? What is, what is a woman? Why does God care about sex? Why does God care about what we do with our bodies? Um, uh, I believe yesterday one or two people were uh, wanting a prayer team at the end of the seminar. I'm told that today there will be. So if you would like someone to talk to and pray with about any of the things that, that have come up about this, do just come down to the front uh, on my left uh, after we finish. But as yesterday, we're going to finish by uh, saying together, uh, this is from Revelation chapter 7. So, then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen. Amen.